Paul's second missionary journey. He's going to start by going to a familiar place, Galatia. Galatia, there you have Lystra and Derby and Iconium. If that sounds familiar, it's because we read about them already. In the first missionary journey, this is the second. Barnabas and John Mark have decided to go a separate route, and Paul, he's going to go through the mountains. He actually starts this journey in Tarsus. Then he's going to go up over the Tarsus Mountains. He and Luke and Silas and Timothy are going to travel by foot to Galatia. Acts chapter 16. Verse 1. Paul came to Derby and then Lystra. That's like southern Galatia. So they all had accents. Where a disciple named Timothy lived. Timothy. Why does his name sound familiar? Well, Paul wrote a couple pastoral letters or epistles to Timothy. First Timothy and Second Timothy. It's believed that Timothy got saved on Paul's first missionary trip. If you go to, I think it's Second Timothy chapter one verse five, he addresses Timothy as my true son. And they think he was really a son in the Lord, came to belief and faith in Christ through Paul's preaching. Now, on this first missionary journey, Timothy was probably a teenager. We know that because if you go to 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12. And I had to memorize this. You notice I looked it up. I don't have it memorized anymore. But back when I was in the youth group, this was the Nazarene Youth International verse. Do not, and I'm in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12. He was a young pastor. Timothy was, and Paul says, Do not let anyone look down on you because you are young. So this is about 15 years after the second missionary journey. If he's 30, he's kind of an old young man. If you subtract 30 from 15, he's what? A teenager. So that first missionary journey, he's kind of young. Let me finish that verse. 1 Timothy 4.12. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in life, in love, in faith, and in purity. Go back to first Acts chapter 16, verse 1. Paul came to Derby and then Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother, we hear about her in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. We read about his grandma there, too. But Timothy's mother was Jewish and a believer whose father was a Greek. The Greek tense 
used for the word was, it implies that Timothy's dad is dead. So, she's a single mom, and she's Jewish, who is a believer. Now, look at verse 2. The believers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of Timothy. Anybody want to take a walk to, uh, there's a Dunkin' Donuts in Lakeville. Who wants to walk there? None of us. No matter how bad we might want a cup of coffee. But that's about the distance from Iconium to Lystra. And everyone in between spoke well of him. That's pretty cool, isn't it? That's before the days of RAV4s and Facebook. and So he's got a good reputation. For 20 miles at least. Paul wanted to take him along on the journey. So he circumcised him. Wait a minute. Did I scare you? Why would he circumcise Timothy? Last week we talked about how they wrote a letter that they don't need to circumcise. What did we learn about Timothy's mom? She was Jewish. What did we learn about Timothy's dad? Greek and dead. So he's half Jew, and they knew his dad was a Greek, but he's half Jew. Paul made the decision, and Timothy must have been okay with it, that the work might go a lot easier, especially with the Jewish church, if Timothy was circumcised. Plus, when you read about it in Galatians and in the letter last week, to whom was the letter of the apostles addressed? The Gentiles. There were Jewish people saying that Gentile believers weren't really saved until they were circumcised. Timothy was not all Gentile. Titus was. So Paul did not circumcise Titus. We read about that in Galatians chapter 2. But in this case, the decision was made to circumcise Timothy. Verse 3. Paul wanted to take Timothy along on the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they traveled, from town to town, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and the elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, how do you say that? Mysia, Mysia, Asia, Mysia. Let's say Mysia, Mysia. They entered Bithynia by the Spirit. Do I sound like your first graders now? Bithynia, by the Spirit, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. Sounds funny, doesn't it? Paul wants to go right. Spirit says no. Paul wants to go left. Spirit of Jesus says no. He just keeps going on straight. The timing just wasn't right yet. Guess when... Paul goes to Asia. 
his third missionary journey. That is when he establishes the church in Ephesus. And if Eric is watching, it's the church in Ephesus. Just before we came in, I, I said, well, let me give you the whole story. I'm going to tattle on Lynn's church. The youth group in Lynn's church a long time ago had a sleepover. And the movie they watched was Night of the Living Dead. Doesn't seem appropriate, right? Then I mentioned out in the foyer, I said Ephesians, and I pronounced it correctly. In Ephesians chapter 2, it says we were all dead in Christ. I'm sorry, we were all dead before we found Christ. We were the walking dead. And then we were made alive in Christ. So you read about zombies in Ephesians chapter 2. Probably not. Spiritual zombies, they're, the, they're dead, but they don't know they're dead. There's still a lot out there. Dead in sin, I think is how Paul puts it in Ephesians. I'm working on it. What's that? How'd I do, Pastor Denny? Lynn wants to know. All right, it is good. So that's when Paul goes to the church in Ephesus. He goes to Asia on his third journey. Verse 8, so they passed by Maja and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing there and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready, whoa, 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 whoa. What's this we stuff? <laughs> Who's the author of this book and the Gospel of Luke? Yes, Luke. This is the first time we see Luke includes himself. He was a part of this missionary journey. For at least a portion of it, Dr. Luke is there. Verse 10. After Paul had seen the vision... We got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. From Troas, we put out to sea and sailed straight for some moth race. You know what's cool about some moth race? It was an island, a very tall island, 5,000 feet. Now, when I drive home or back and forth from West Virginia to Springwater, when I get around Wellsville, there's a sign, highest elevation, 2,106 feet, I think. I think it's, I'll look next week, 2,106 feet. Now imagine that island, oh, more than twice that size pretty high above sea level. So that was a spot where people, when they traveled by boat, would often stop because they could see it. It was easy to navigate the way it stuck up out of the Mediterranean Sea. So they sailed straight for some moth race, and the next day kind of implies that they ported there. And the next day we went to Neapolis. From there, we traveled to Philippi. Now, why does Philippi look familiar? Paul wrote to the Philippians, to the church in Philippi. You want to know some pretty cool history about Philippi. Back then, it was a pretty busy city. It was a city that was founded in 146 B.C. by the father of Alexander the Great. Guess what his name was? Philip of Macedonia. 
and that's how I got the name Philippi. It no longer exists. It's a ghost town. The city was wiped out by malaria. But it existed when Paul was there. From there, verse 12, we travel to Philippi, a Roman colony and a leading city of the district of Macedonia. And we stayed there several days. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river. They went down to the river to pray. Now, what's different about that compared to all of Paul's other visits to towns and cities? Usually, they had a synagogue right on, Pastor. There were not enough Jews in this city for them to have a synagogue. There just wasn't enough interest. So, on Sabbath, they would go down to the river. I wonder if they sang that song. <laughs> you don't think so, Joyce? You don't think they had a choir director? And... <laughs> I don't think the church was established yet to sing that song in Philippi. The Jewish church, I don't know if they sang it or not. But verse 13, on the Sabbath... We went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who'd gathered there. One of them, listening, was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. Anyone here whose favorite color is purple? You're wearing purple. It's not your favorite color. If it were your favorite color and you lived in Philippi or that general region, you would have very expensive taste because purple cloth was highly valued because it was difficult to find the shellfish where they would get the dye to make the purple cloth. But Lydia was a dealer in purple cloth. And she was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us into her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. Just from this little bit we know about Lydia, we know that she was a pretty good businesswoman. She was a dealer in purple cloth. So she must have been good in what she, she, she did because she had a decent-sized house that she could afford. Because how many guests did she invite to stay? Almost. Higher. Yes, death three is the right answer because there were three. But there were four. Paul, Silas, Timothy, and Luke. And her family who was baptized. So there they are. Yeah, Barry. Going back to the purple cloth, um, would they have any um, connection with the cross, having a purple cloth around the cross? That I do not know. Just the reason people put a purple cloth around the cross, there was not a purple robe at the cross. People do that to designate Christ's royalty. It kind of speaks to when, I think it was the Praetorium of Herod, where Jesus was flogged, and they put a cloth on him there. They put a robe on him and the crown of thorns, and then they bowed down to the king and mocked him. So... That's where the purple cloth comes from. I 
don't think it has anything to do with shellfish and what Lydia did. Right. Yeah. Good question. See, good question. Ding. So we know that Paul and his companions stayed there for a while. Because we get to verse 16, and it says, Once, which implies we've done this multiple times, but once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. The Greek word there for spirit is python. Sounds like a snake doesn't it? Well, in their culture, they worship the god Apollos. And they believed that when Apollos made his presence known, he would show up in the form of a snake. And that he would cause people to speak on their behalf. Isn't it interesting that that's the word there? And you think about what a python does when it gets a hold of you. It squeezes you. It wraps around you pretty tight. It's hard to escape, huh? Well, here we have a a slave girl who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us. And she was shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. The devil, the boss of the demons, he's the father of lies, the author of lies. Clearly, demons can't lie about Jesus. (laughs) And they can't lie about the gospel. What are they saying? This demon-possessed girl saying, this guy preaches how you can be saved. It's kind of consistent with what demons do. Go to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. I want to read verse 41 to 28. Jesus is, excuse me. Jesus and his disciples went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went to the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he talked to them as one who had authority not as the teachers of the law. Just then, a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, Jesus said sternly. Come out of him. In my English class in high school, I learned that's called foreshadowing. Foreshadowing. You kind of maybe now have an idea what Paul is going to do to the python lady. Verse 25, Mark chapter 1. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The evil spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, What is this? A new teaching and with authority. He even gives orders to evil spirits and they obey him. And news about him spread quickly over the whole region. It's not the only time that kind of thing happened with Jesus. 
Go to Luke chapter 4. We read the same account, actually. I thought I read another one studying for the night. But Luke chapter 4, I did. There's two occurrences of this in chapter 4. The one we just read in Mark chapter 1 is found in Luke 4 verses 31 to 37. And that's almost word for word, kind of lines up with what we read in Mark. But if you go down a little farther, verse 40. Jesus has healed many people in Luke chapter 4. Verse 40 says this. When the sun was setting, the people brought to Jesus all kinds of people with various kinds of sickness. And laying his hands on each one, Jesus healed them. Moreover, demons came out of many people. And what did they shout? You are the Son of God. But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because they knew he was the Christ. Evil knows when it's beat. Evil knows when the victor's there. And what did that lady who had that evil spirit yell in Acts chapter 16? Verse 17. These men are servants of the Most High God and are telling you the way to be saved. The words, the way, stood out to me. They're telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so troubled that he turned around and said to the Spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. That moment, the spirit left her. When the owners of the slave girl realized that their hope of making any more money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas, dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates, And said, these men are Jews. Just want to remind you, Philippi was located in Roman territory. They're surrounded by Gentiles. The first thing these people do is play the race card. These men are Jews. And they're throwing our city into an uproar. Who wants a riot in their city? Apparently Portland. Besides Portland. I guess I shouldn't try to be funny because that's sad. But who wants a riot in their city? And they're saying, these guys, these Jews, are trying to stir things up in our city. By advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. They're trying to teach us to do things that are It's not who we are. The crowd join in on the attack against Paul and Silas. And the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten. Two times in the book of Acts. When Paul and his crew or Actually, it was just Paul and his crew. Because even when the disciples were persecuted, they were persecuted by Jews. Two times, Paul and his crew were not persecuted by Jews. The first is this one in Philippi. And the second is in Acts chapter 19 when he's in Ephesus. In both cases, it involves money. What started all this? These guys were upset. 
Because when that demon was cast out, no more fortune telling. No more dinero or whatever they used back then. Caesar's head was probably on the coins. Get this though. Verse 23. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. Upon receiving such orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in stocks. What's so important about that? Have you ever been to a theme park where you kind of put your hands and your head through and it looks like you're in, in trouble and you got put in the stocks? These stalks, it's actually the Greek word for wood, they had different size holes on them. Now, mind you, mind you, they have just been beaten with rods, severely flogged, is how Luke put it. And these wooden stalks that their feet are being put in have holes at different lengths apart. So they would stretch their legs very far apart to strain them. Doesn't sound very comfortable, does it? So here they are. And what do they do? Yeah. <laughs> there was a choir. Verse 25, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were, they were listening to him. Wow. That's something we believers have that really is pretty special. That no matter what we're going through, Nothing can keep us from praying and singing. And as we used to sing a lot on Wednesday and Sunday nights here, it's amazing what praising can do. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everybody's chains came loose and everybody at Bible study just thought of the hymn by Charles Wesley, And Can It Be? Because that's what inspired him to write that. My that's good. Satan can hem us in, but never prevent, never prevent us from looking up. It's good. Verse 27, the jailer woke up. I mean, he had no reason to stay awake. These guys were severely flogged, beaten with rods, and their legs were very far apart. <laughs> he could go to sleep. That's what he did. And then verse 27 tells us, the jailer woke up. An earthquake will do that. And when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, Don't harm yourself. We're all here. The jailer called for the lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out. In the Greek, it says he fastened them together. So he brought all of them out. If that helps with the word picture in your mind. He fastened them together, brought them out. And then he said to them, Sirs, 
Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now, where would he get that idea? That he needed to be saved. Well, go back up to verse 17. There is the python lady shouting for many days. These are the... How long was she shouting? Many days. Maybe on his commute to the jail, he heard this. These men are the servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. And if that is the case, how about that? The enemy was used so that someone would be saved. That's a pretty wild thought. The words of the demon were used and people were saved. What must I do to be saved? They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your whole household. Do you think that anything there is missing? Where is the repentance? Let me tell you why the repentance probably isn't there. Because it was already there. <laughs> I think Paul and Silas knew this guy truly believed and turned and didn't have to say repent. <laughs> I think the spirit of repentance had already taken place. He was ready. I mean, they saved him from killing himself. He saw an earthquake and survived it. And all these guys, were still there. They could have run off. And even if he didn't kill himself, he'd be dead because he let him run off. Anyway. Verse 31. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. And they probably talked about repentance there, turning to the Lord, following him. I mean... They spoke the word of the Lord to the jailer and to all others in his house. Verse 33. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Can you imagine? Beaten, severely flogged, put in stalks for the night. I'd be worried about infections when my feet were in them stalks. It wasn't until now that their wounds were cleaned. And the jailer, who's a jailer, not a physician, not a nurse, but graciously and lovingly cleans their wounds. And if they were severely flogged, their wounds were probably grotesque. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and his family were all baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole family. When it was daylight, the magistrate sent their officers to the jailer with the order, release those men. When it says he sent the officers, the word for officers literally means rod bearers. So most likely the guys who had flogged Paul and Silas, the ones who were going to get him out, bring him before the magistrate. Verse 36, the jailer told Paul, the magistrates have ordered that you and Silas be released. Now you can leave Go in peace. Yes, the jailer took them to his house. It, it's not clear, 
most likely the jailer got a text. (laughs) Most likely the jailer went back. If there's a big earthquake and things crumble, most likely the jailer was there and he got word that the magistrates wanted Paul released. Especially when the rod bearers showed up and there was nobody to get. But that, that part of the account is left out. So we don't know the details there. But we know that the jailer did get the message. Time to let these guys go. Let them go in peace. Verse 37. But Paul said to the officers. Well, maybe Paul was there when... The officers gave the jailer the news, Betty. Yeah, maybe they went back to the prison after they were at the jailer's house. Yeah, they must have went back to the prison. All right. Verse 37. Paul said to the officers, they beat us publicly without a trial, even though we are Roman citizens. And right then, the magistrate said, ruh we shouldn't have done that. They're Roman citizens. And then they threw us into prison. And now, do they want to get rid of us quietly? No, let them come themselves and escort us out. See, Jesus doesn't want us to be doormats. (laughs) Right there's evidence. Doormats. And let people bully us or walk all over us. But he didn't bully back. Paul didn't. Paul sought justice. I mean, he wasn't a jerk about it. He said, we're Roman citizens, and what happened to us was unfair. Verse 38, the officers reported this to the magistrates. Oh, that's when they said, row, row. And when they heard that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, they were alarmed they came to appease them and escorted them from the prison just like Paul asked requesting them to leave the city after Paul and Silas came out of the prison they went to Lydia's house they didn't leave did they they went to Lydia's house where they met with the brothers and encourage them. Then they left. What do we learn about transforming discipleship? Those guys encouraged others after they were persecuted, after they were severely flogged. They weren't like, poor me. That's, that's what I do. <laughs> They weren't afraid to witness. I mean, we knew, we know that there were others in the prison because those others were listening to them pray and sing the hymns. Pretty amazing stuff. The Holy Spirit can bring us through as we serve Him.